This week on Sneak Previews, posse about a tight-knit band of cowboys in a western the likes of which you've probably never seen before. And Lost in Yonkers, Neil Simon's gentle screen adaptation of his Pulitzer Prize-winning memory play. And Map of the Human Heart, a sweeping romantic epic set during World War II. Plus two other titles on this week's Sneak Previews. And Louie, just sit on the chair. I've been sitting all night, Bella. I think I'll stand, okay? Louie, it would be much better if you were sitting. I pictured everybody sitting. I don't want to sit. Change the picture. Picture everybody else sitting and me standing. Louie, Louie, can't you just sit for a few minutes till Bella tells us what, what it is she wants to talk to us about? Okay, okay, here. All right. Is this how you pictured it, Bella? No, I pictured you sitting on the chair that I picked out. Bella... It's very important that I leave here very soon. Very important. Now, I don't want to get you upset, sweetheart, but I don't want to spend my time getting the seating arrangements right. Now, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to listen, and then I'm going to go. I pictured everybody sitting. Stop arguing with and sit down, for God's sakes, before you get into one of the moods again. Louis, quiet. Got to Stop it. Louis, quiet. Louis, stay. Louis, eat. You don't scare me anymore, Ma. Maybe everybody else here, but not me. You understand? Louis, sit. <laughs> that was Irene Worth as the iron-willed matriarch of a troubled family, ordering around two of her children, Richard Dreyfus and Mercedes Rule, in 1942. It's a scene from Lost in Yonkers, Neil Simon's screen adaptation of his Pulitzer Prize-winning Broadway play. And just one of five titles we'll be reviewing on this week's Sneak Previews. I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And I'm Michael Medved, and I was particularly eager to see Lost in Yonkers because it's directed by Martha Coolidge, who made one of my favorite films of 1991, Ramblin' Rose. And this one is another memory film about difficult years at the edge of adolescence. At the beginning of this film, Lost in Yonkers, a widower father takes his two boys to go live with their grandmother in Yonkers, a suburb of New York, when his job as a salesman takes him constantly on the road. The boys soon discover that beneath their grandmother's tough, mean, unpleasant exterior is an equally tough and unpleasant <laughs> inner self as well. And one of the few Just bright spots kid. in their grim life with her yeah. in her candy yeah. store comes when they get a visit from the black sheep of the family, their swaggering Uncle Louie, played by Richard what? Dreyfus. What is it? This? Don't worry about it. Just holding it for a friend. This cop I know, he's, uh... He's on a camping trip with his kids. He, he, he don't want no accidents. Is it loaded? Gee, I hope not. If it goes off now, I have to become a ballerina. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never knew a policeman could lend his gun to someone. You got a real smart brother there. Did you know that, Artie? You're right, Jay. It's my gun. I'm a bodyguard for a very important, very prominent political figure. I don't like being an FBI man. <laughs> Only they call it something else. You mean a henchman? Who's been telling you stories like that, Jay? No, I swear. Don't you ever repeat that word around to anyone again. You understand me? I didn't mean to say it. I was thinking a hunchback. Hey, we got a couple of jokers here. Don't try to pull my leg, Artie. It might come off in your hands. You home for good, or just as a visit? I don't know. I thought I would come back and talk to you about that. Yeah, the way you talked to me the night that you left. Without a word? No, not without a word. I told you how I felt. You were the one that walked out on me, Mama. Well, Grandma bullies say? everyone around her, particularly her daughter, Bella, who's well played by Oscar winner Mercedes Rule. Now, Bella is a strange, scatterbrained, childlike creature who runs away from home because of her love for a theater usher, but eventually finds her way back to confront her overbearing mother. I'm not crying. And it's not because I'm afraid to cry. It's because I got no tears left in me. I feel pretty empty inside. Like you feel all the time. How would you know how I feel? Boy, you just don't think I know anything, do you? You think I'm stupid, don't you? No, you're not stupid. Then what am I? Am I crazy? You think I'm crazy? Don't use that word to me. Why not? Are you afraid of it? Mama, if that's what I am, don't be afraid to say it. Because if I'm crazy, I should be in a home. 
I really like this, and I'm surprised that I did, Michael, because too often I'll say, perhaps too often, I'll say, oh, this is too stagey. Mm -hmm. And it did remind me of the Broadway play, which I loved. But I like the fact that at this time of year, with blockbusters coming out, somebody has the courage to make and release a movie that asks you to listen to the characters, get absorbed in the story. And it's not the most thrilling movie I've ever seen. It's even not the best Neil Simon on screen, but it does have some very poignant so moments. So what you're saying it. is give it an A for effort, which I'll grant it, but right. I don't think it's a very good movie. It's Why? not satisfying at all. I think in that scene there, she says, uh, sometimes I feel pretty empty inside. I think that's the way you feel when you come out of this picture. A lot of people are going to go to see this thinking, a lot of people are going to go see this thinking it's like Biloxi Blues or it's Brighton not, Beach not Memoirs. Those are very warm, nostalgic, upbeat, loving movies. This is about a radically dysfunctional family that's full of self-destructive behavior. You never really get a clue as to why they're having that behavior. And frankly, I don't think even the performances are that good. Well, I think you're overanalyzing. I think Irene Worth is tremendous. Yeah, they were smart enough to take her and Mercedes Rule from the Broadway stage and give them, they're not big movie stars, her Oscar notwithstanding from Miss Rule, and to give them the chance to do it on, sta uh, on screen, they took Richard Dreyfuss, who replaced Kevin Spacey. They they're very work very well together, but I think you're expecting a typical Neil Simon no, comedy. No, I'm not at and all. It's not. I'm not at all. You're talking about their intentions. I'm talking about the way these performances work. I understand. Work. I think they I work thought very every well. moment, and you can see it right there in those clips, every moment you're conscious that these are very good actors who are acting. Richard Dreyfuss is one of the finest actors in films today, no question. But here, there's not a single moment in his performance when you say, oh, there's Richard Dreyfuss. Watch him act. It's a very You were doing that when you were watching? Absolutely. I wasn't. And in fact, I, I was able to put apart the performance I had seen on the stage by Kevin Spacey, and I admire Richard Dreyfuss for taking a small role. He's kind of uplifting in the movie because he is a breath of fresh air. It is a very intense movie. It has some slow moments. I'm glad they made this You picture. use the word stagey. That's my final word on this picture. Well, next up is <laughs> Posse, starring and directed by Mario Van Peebles, in which he plays one of a group of black soldiers who fight together in Cuba in the Spanish-American War. During a battle, they come upon a fortune in gold and decide to keep it. But just after the conflict, they run into their unscrupulous commander, Billy Zane, who wants the treasure for himself. Good morning, gentlemen. Seem to have lost our way home, have we? Out of uniform and an AWOL is no way to end a career, Jesse. But rest assured, the record will show you all died heroes. <laughs> What about the goal? Mm. Well, I believe the answer to that one is what gold? Tell me how come you did. Now they managed to hang on to the gold and flee back to America, where a gambler joins the group. And in this scene, he's asked the gang's only white member, Stephen Baldwin, why Baldwin's joined the band. Seems to me. The only problem the white man has with the colored man is that he's afraid. You know how people are always afraid of what they don't know? Or what they don't understand? Me, uh, I ain't afraid of much. Except boredom. <laughs> Believe you me, riding with Jesse Lee, you ain't never gonna be bored. <laughs> yeah, well, I think most people notice if we were partners. No, 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 no. It's the friend and the stranger scam. I'm telling you, it is perfect. Man came five rest in his sleep. Damn. This is a very violent western, but much of it is done in a highly stylized manner, evoking those old Clint Eastwood spaghetti westerns of director Sergio Leone back in the 60s, like this showdown which comes later between Van Peebles and a local sheriff.
Boy, I was powerfully disappointed by this film, I gotta tell you, because Mario Van Peebles is a star. He's a terrific sure screen is. presence. I mean, he's a fine actor. He's also shown that he can be a very slick, successful, interesting director, as he did with his last film, New Jack City. But here, I think this film fails on just about every level. Even the action scenes, which is what most people are gonna go see this picture to see, don't work because they're incoherently edited. You can't follow what's going on, who's fighting who, what's happening. And when even the action scenes in a Western like this don't work, you know you're in big trouble. Well, the film is put together clumsily. However, it is very fast-paced. It's usually not the kind of movie I endorse because the, uh, the gore and the incessant violence mm -hmm. is almost the main focus of the movie. That's but all I think there is. No, there's, there's more than that. There are too many characters in the movie, to be sure, and they're flashbacks. However, the action sequences are done, again, evoking that those old Clint Eastwood movies. And it does tell a story up to a point which I think had to be told. There were a lot of African-American cowboys. It starts with Woody Strode, that majestic actor who was in Spartacus fighting Kirk Douglas. He's telling the story in a flashback. Now, you had to make it in the Spanish-American <laughs> right. War, otherwise he would have been 150 years old. Right, but the you timing, the timing, is, yes, the timing, the timing is, is all off. It shouldn't be that. said in 1898. It's full of anachronisms. I mean, one of the things that I thought was struck by is that Marvin Peebles is also credited as the producer of the soundtrack album. And as a result of that, you have all of this totally yeah. incongruous music, but which you see be, people singing back in 1898. Yeah, but that can't be why you didn't like yeah, it. No, but I mean, that's a great deal. Because, you see, what you said before is absolutely accurate. There were over 8,000 African-American cowboys. And they And uh, they estimate sometimes that a third of all cowboys were African-American. It's a fascinating subject. And they begin to give you the idea they're going to treat it seriously. The film begins with some beautiful old sepia photographs, authentic photographs. But then it completely abandons any historical it has authenticity. Problems. This it has is a ragged. story that deserves to be told better than Look, it is here. Maybe so. It ha right now, it's, except for Sergeant Rutledge and Glory, both of which dealt with black soldiers, there are very few movies which dealt with the subject at any level, and I think on that level it, su it succeeds. It's got a big style but, about it but again, and a good you're, star. you're saying that it had some good efforts. I'm it also becomes incredibly politically preachy. They try to take it away yeah, from just they, being they an action right. movie into being a powerful social statement, and I don't think those elements work it at all either. It has its flaws, but I'm voting yes on it. Next up, meanwhile, is Map of the Human Heart, a gigantic epic stretching from the Arctic in the 1930s to the dangerous skies over Nazi Germany during World War II. This is a lavish romance which traces the life of a young Eskimo from boyhood into old age. It begins in 1931 on the then trackless barren tundra of the Arctic where a Canadian army pilot, Patrick Bergen, who's come to map the region, befriends a young Eskimo boy named Avik and here he gives the wild-eyed youngster a ride on his airplane. Ready, go! We then see Avik as a young man. He's now played by Jason Scott Lee, whom you saw here last week in Dragon. He's now a bombardier based in England during the war. And in this scene, he has a reunion with his childhood sweetheart, played by Annie Paradell of La Femme Nikita. Here is a half-breed Cree Indian girl he'd met in an orphanage years ago. I'm no ghost. I never thought I'd see you again. You've nearly finished your tour? Only boy's been lucky. How come you're here in England, too? Wait. Wait. But Avik quickly realizes that the map he'd intended to use to her heart may have acquired a fork or two on the road. I didn't think you'd come. It's wonderful you're here. I only read your message this morning. Oh. North Africa, but don't you dare. I have a surprise for you. But I need a bed. She really loves you. Havoc! <laughs> We're not strangers, are we? Walter. 
Uncle John. Yeah. Hello. Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> you gave Albertine the x-ray. Went all the way to Ottawa. One thing led to another. Fate brought us together. And of course, Albertine's skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> this film is a triumph. I is mean, it? I think is it, it is a knockout. Certainly one of the best films I've seen this year. Vincent Ward was a director. He's a New Zealand director who's only 36 years old. He'd previously done a picture called The Navigator, which was a weird time travel movie of people going from the medieval era to modern times. But it had something in common with this, which is that every scene was so haunting, so unusual, done from such a strange perspective that it stays with you, as I think this pi picture is going to stay with anybody who goes to see it. Even though you and I see movies literally a continent apart, it is so refreshing to know that occasionally you copy from my notes, Michael. I agree with you, in other words, 100%. A man a, of rare discernment right, you are, this Alliance. is a keen observers of the obvious we are. This is a beautiful movie with a sweep again, but also there are little elements in it that remind you that it is a movie. When they recreate the bombing in World War II, you can see, you, you know that they're kind of studio miniatures, and you accept all that, but of course by that time you're swept up into everything in the movie. But, Who would have thought an Eskimo frankly, movie with released in the spring would be fun? <laughs> With starring a Hawaiian as right. the Eskimo, right? right? Jason Scott Lee, who is so good in Dragon yep. and is even a more phenomenal star. here. He's a phenomenal young actor. He's 26 years old, but you talked about the bombing sequences. One of the things that is astonishing about this is there's been, a, of course, a lot of discussion. People read about the firebombing of Dresden. It's dramatized here in an absolutely unforgettable way. And I think the sequences inside the, uh, the bomber, uh, bombers with the bombardiers is, is, are every bit as chilling and realistic as what you saw in Memphis Bell, which right. is a movie that I liked very and much. See if you can spot Jean Moreau in a small but pivotal role early in the movie. I mean, good for her to take on this kind of role, which yes. is unlike almost anything she's ever done. Great French actress. It's a movie that just sweeps you up. And, and, it's, and it's about fate. It's one of those things I think that a lot of people can identify with, particularly if you're an incurable romantic. It's about two people being connected when they're children and having that relationship follow you for the rest of your life and in fact dominate the entire course of your life. And you also see Patrick Bergen briefly in this and he has a very pivotal role in the movie. He's sure. a good actor from Patriot Games, a good Irish actor and good for him to take a supporting role here but he plays a very important part in what goes on. A very strange movie, a very haunting one but one that I don't think people are going to forget or should miss. So next up is our family fine section of the show where as usual I'm afraid to say there is no new film that's opening up in theaters that's really aimed at family audiences, but My Neighbor Totoro, which we recommended last week, is still playing in many cities around the country. Now on home video, however, this week brings the release of a wonderful new series of tapes that ought to find their way into every home where parents care about introducing their kids to some of the glories of English literature. Now this series is called Shakespeare the Animated Tales, and it features some handsome animation by Russian artists and readings by actors from the Royal Shakespeare Company, as in this scene from A Midsummer Night's Dream. The first introduction to Shakespeare was through classic comics. <laughs> Remember those? They were lovely. They were lovely. We, we didn't use Not them to cheat on exams, although Not I know bad. some kids did. But this is a wonderful way to introduce this generation to the, to the wonderful world of Shakespeare. I think even better than classic Why'd comics. Why'd you laugh I mean, so hard? You don't remember no, classic comics? What I was thinking so of, my, my own introduction was, uh, there was a, a terrific book that kids used to get called Tales from Shakespeare right. by Charles and Mary I remember Lamb. that one too. I love that. And, and again, I think this is a worthy successor to that because the plays have been condensed. They're, they're, it's obviously not full length, but they've been condensed so intelligently and the animation is so good and it's different for every play as suits the material. Right. I mean, obviously, Macbeth turns out very differently from Midsummer Night's Dream. And they didn't use just anybody. They use uh, trained Shakespearean actors. They're not any stars here, but they're people who understand the material and it's a different form of acting for adults to listen to. It harks back to the old idea of acting just with your voice on radio. Well, the great thing, of course, is it will acquaint kids with Shakespearean language, will prepare them for the peak experience of actually seeing Shakespeare on stage. Pa parents are going to enjoy it as well because some of the animation is just spectacular. And and, and actually, I think it works even best with uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and with The Tempest, where you have so many fairies and supernatural effects, which can be better in animation than they even could be on stage. I can't imagine why nobody thought of this before. Yeah, isn't it great? And th my only hesitation about Midsummer Night's Dream is that they didn't use the wonderful and familiar Felix Mendelssohn music, which I think a lot of people would miss, which was actually written for that play, uh, for, for a version of that play Me years thinks later. you doth protest too much. Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great series anyway. People will love it. Now, next up is our Screen by Teen segment of the show, and this week, our young critics look at the new video release of The Gun in Betty Lou's handbag. Now, in this picture, Penelope Ann Miller plays a shy librarian whose husband is a tough cop who ignores her completely. And then one day, through a series of confusing coincidences, she's implicated in a sleazy mob murder, and she suddenly is getting more attention than she's ever had before. 
She's the only suspect for the murder of Amos oh, come Lansing. come on. Even if it's the same gun, she doesn't have a motive. No, of course not. I mean, anybody else. You might say there were lovers, but not Betty Lou. Betty Lou did no. not have a lover. It's impossible. Oh, anything's possible. There's no way on earth Betty Lou had a lover. <laughs> Betty Lou, you better tell us what you were doing there, because you know how people talk. I mean, first they'll say that you were lovers, and then that you killed him, and then that you were going to kill yourself. You weren't going to do that, were you? I don't know. That's it. Ow, she's only saying what other people might be thinking. Oh, look at her. She couldn't kill a fly. She couldn't kill a germ. Come on, honey. We're going right, to hold on, Perkins. And that's an order. You understand? You stay there. Now, Betty Lou, sweetheart, uh, everybody knows that you're innocent. Alex, all your friends, all of us here know you're innocent. Now, we just need you to tell us that uh, you're innocent, and then you can go on home. Uh, Come on, Lou. Just say it. Just say it, and everything will be just the way it was. I'm guilty. My place got a jail now. Now, our panel met not a jail, but at their usual hangout to see if Betty Lou delivers any surprises from her handbag. Now, what do you think, John? Is this new video good for a few laughs? This was supposed to be a comedy, but either I have a bad sense of humor or it just was not funny. I don't know. Yeah, it wasn't that good at all, and it was so violent. I wasn't expecting yeah. it at all because I just thought this would be like a lighthearted type yeah. of little comedy, yeah. but I, it was so violent. I mean, someone gets shot, people get stabbed and slashed up, and I mean, this really wacky, weird plot just masked this what I found to be like a good theme about female assertiveness because Betty Lou, she pleads guilty to this murder charge because she's so starved for attention. Yeah. Right. So but I thought that was I don't good. know, you guys, the yelling between the actors really got on my nerves. I mean, she's freaking out because, you know, she committed the murder and they want to um, create the illusion of confusion, but they just end up screaming and yelling at each other and it gets on your nerves. Yeah, it sure does. So, but, <laughs> Jonathan here, he hates it. Um, we kind of, so there you have it. It's out on video cassette. Back to you, Michael and Jeffrey. Boy, I'm glad to see that, but I think if anything, the kids were too kind to this movie. I hated every minute of it. I think you're being too harsh. A lot of interesting actors simply caught in the bad vehicle. Nothing so more, kick nothing the less. Tires. Good pun on the word vehicle. I get it. Well, summarizing our opinions on the movies we reviewed this week. Our best bet is Map of the Human Heart, a gorgeous saga of romance and adventure with two rising young stars. There are a few explicit scenes of sex and nudity and some violent moments of wartime bombing raids, but we split on Lost and Yonkers. I liked its nostalgic style and moving performances, but Michael found it drab and stagey. And though the film has some mild language, there's no sexual or violent content to it. We also split strongly on Posse. I thought it was fast moving and slick, but Michael thought it was incoherent and mindless. A shabby treatment of a potentially interesting chapter in history. There's an unending stream of harsh language, some explicit sexual encounters, and naturally in a western plenty of violence. And none of our Screen Eye Teens panel liked the gun in Betty Lou's handbag, which has just arrived in the video store. It includes some surprising doses of sex, violence, and language for a PG-13 movie. Well, that's it for this week. Please join us next time when we'll take a look at some of the early crop of summertime blockbusters, including Sharon Stone's steamy new thriller Sliver and Hot Shots Part Deux with Charlie <laughs> Sheen and Kenneth Branagh's luminous new version of Much Ado About Nothing. I'm Michael Medved. And I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And until next time on Sneak Previews, don't forget to save us the aisle seats.